Hey guys, we thank you for joining us today, man. We hope the next verses ahead are going to be a blessing to you. Grab your Bibles out. We're in Matthew chapter 10 today. Follow along and just let the Lord richly bless your heart, man. Thank you. Jesus was walking along and he was telling the story of his gospel in the book of Matthew and he got his 12 disciples together after all night praying over which 12 he was going to choose and he chose them and then they all followed him and then he sends them out two by two and he sent them only to the household of Israel you guys are only going to speak to Israelites there was a lot of cities and towns in Israel that were not Israeli towns. They, they, they had been occupied. They were Greek towns, Roman towns. And Jesus says, don't go to those folks. I want you going to Israel first. Because why? Because the prophets of the Old Testament talked about a Messiah coming, an Israeli, who would be the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Chosen One of God, who would come and save the people of Israel. First, and if the people of Israel wouldn't believe, it's to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Gentile. And that's what we understood. And when Moses was here, Moses went up to Mount Sinai and God gave him the word of the Lord. Gave him Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And most specifically, gave him the Ten Commandments. And the first commandments deal with our relationship with God. The second part of the Ten Commandments deals with our relationship with individuals. And if we get the God thing right, we'll have the individual thing right. When I can realize and remember that I'm always in the presence of the Lord. Oh, man. I wish I was perfect, don't you? We ain't. We boo-boo. We make mistakes. We fall way short of the glory of God. And that's what makes the gospel the gospel. That word means good news. God's good news is that he loves imperfect people. We were just talking a second ago before church started here. Every second with God is a new beginning. It doesn't matter what just happened. It doesn't matter how short you fell just now. It's when you realize, oh man, Lord, you're dealing with an imperfect individual here. I want to walk your ways. He sets us up on our feet and sends us on our way as though it never happened. And the hardest thing we got to do is forgive ourselves. We were just discussing that. You've got to be able to forgive yourself. If you can't forgive yourself, you're going to give place to the devil. You're going to give him victory. You're going to give him a foothold in the door. Yeah, you blew it. Yeah, you were dumb. Yeah, you made this humongous mistake. But get up, let the Lord dust you off, and send you on your way. Remember what he told us in the, the last part. We're going to study this in Matthew 28. He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he hasn't said stop yet. He said go. So in the middle of our going, when we fall, when we falter, get back up, dust yourself off, and go still. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't let thoughts from the enemy come and put you down. we got to have this word in our hearts. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. And that's what, why we encourage you. That's why we impress it in your hearts, in your heads, in your minds, in, in your soul to read the word. Know the word. Because the word is your salvation. Well, I thought Jesus was my salvation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The words in this book, the Bible tells us every word of God is pure, and it says that every one of these words in this book are inspired. That word means God breathed. And Paul was writing to Timothy. He says every word in here is God's Word. It's the words of Jesus from the Holy Spirit of God speaking to the hearts of men, and they penned exactly what God wanted them to write. We were, we were listening last week to Brooke and Reagan talk about a show they saw on the History Channel, downplaying the Word of God. Guys, if a professor, some guy who deems himself to be wise, if he ever says the Word of God is not what God said the Word of God is, that man, woman, is a liar. They are presenting to you the doctrine the Bible calls of demons, the doctrines of devils. Let God be true and every man a what? Liar. 
all men are liars. And we can't rest our laurels, our, our, our beliefs, our faith on what some guy said. That's why it's important for us to know what the God said. And so the Word became flesh. The Word of God is Jesus. It's His Spirit. And when you read that Word, you're understanding who Jesus is, and His Holy Spirit is convincing you, teaching you, comforting you in the facts of the Gospel, of the Scripture. And so we want you to have this in your head, heart, mind, and soul. Because if you don't have it in your head, heart, mind, and soul, when you do fall, because you're going to fall, you'll stay down there a whole lot longer. And you will wallow in, in misery and pain and sin that you shouldn't be wallowing in. And self, self deprivation, man. The, the enemy wants to come and he accuse you. Remember what he is. He's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses you to you and he accuses you to God. And he's just accuser, accuser, accuser. But Jesus Christ has freed us from the accuser. And he set us free. And the more we know of this word, the more we know his heart. And his heart is I've saved you, I've cleaned you up. Get up and continue on in your going. And so he said, go ye into all the world. And he hadn't said stop yet. So get up and go. And so we're still studying here in the, in the book of Matthew. And we saw there in verse 23, he says, well, they're going to persecute you. Now, what, what we're talking about is the, the Old Testament uh, writers, the prophets, they, were, they came up right to the mountain. And, and they saw the mountain of Israel. They saw the mountain of God's word. They saw the truth. And they spoke concerning this mountain. And in this case, we're saying it's Israel. They saw about Israel. They wrote about Israel. They prophesied about Israel. They said, Israel, if you quit following after the Lord, you're going to have judgment come upon you. And what they couldn't see was the other mountain behind the mountain they were in front of. And that was in time Israel. And between this mountain and that mountain, it was a valley area called the church age. And they didn't understand the church age in the Old Testament. It was foreign to them. All they knew that God came to Israel. Well, Israel, the Bible tells us, rejected his choice, his anointed one, his Messiah, Jesus, as their Messiah. And so he says, if you don't praise me, the rocks and all of creation will. He said, Jews, if you don't appreciate me, and if you don't praise me, and if you don't accept me, I will go to a people who will. That's the Gentiles, all the non-Jews. And God turned his heart toward us. Not, not, he didn't turn it away from them and cast them down, but he said, I'm going to send my gospel my messenger, Jesus himself, the God of heaven, to a people who will accept him. And aren't you grateful that the story came your way about Jesus Christ and his salvation? And Jesus put the first mountain on hold, and he got over that mountain, that was the cross, Mount Calvary. And that now he's been dealing in the valley with us for, for these 2,000 years. And this time frame is about to be complete, about to be finished up. And then he's going to deal with the second part of that mountain, which is Israel again. And that dealing will take place for seven years. What we believe is going to happen in this Bible study is the very next thing on God's timeline is the rapture, the snatching away of true believers, the people who belong to his true church who are his true church people. Not people who go to Christian churches, but people who walk with him when they step outside the church building. People who have heart for him. People who know that he's the only way to forgive them, and it's only by his forgiveness, his blood, that we can be forgiven. It's those people who've received that, who've confessed their sins to him, said, Lord, I'm so imperfect, I, I, I can't get to heaven because heaven is a place for perfect people. But I, I've heard somewhere through your word and preachers of the gospel, soul winners, that they said that if I would come to you, you'd take away all my sin and make me as though I've never sinned a day in my life. That word's called justified. God justifies us. He makes us just as if I've never sinned a day in my life. Now that is a good deal, folks. When you consider your sinful past and what you've done and the stupid mistakes you've made and the ones you've made that weren't mistakes, they were on purpose. You were hard-hearted, stiff-necked, and you knew it was sin, and you stepped out and you sinned anyway. God will forgive those. And that's what he wants to do. That's why he's in business. He's in business to love a people who are unlovely. He loves sinners. While we were still sinners, while we were still gnarly, while we were still yuck, he died for us and loved us. Aren't you thankful? That's a good story. That's the gospel story. That's good news. And God wants us to share that good news. That's what he told us to do. Go into all the world and preach the good news. That word preach means proclaim. It doesn't mean stand up in front of a class. It just means proclaim. When the, when the opportunity avails itself, 
step into that opportunity and bring Jesus into the sitch. Bring Jesus into the conversation. And that's what God wants us to do. And that's what he says. So when, when he first started talking here in the book of Matthew chapter 10, he was talking to his disciples and they were to only go to the first mountain, the people of Israel. Now we see him looking down in the future. And this verse here is continuing on with us. It says, but when they persecute you in whatever city you're in, flee to another city. Don't sit there and be killed. Don't sit there knowing that, that the killer is coming if you can get away from the killer. Because God wants to use us somewhere else. If he can't use me in this town, he wants to use me in another town. There's reports this week that three generals were fired. These were among the 11 generals we talked about before. But because they disobeyed orders from the top to release nuclear EMPs over the United States of America to destroy the power grid for 300 million Americans. At the beginning of hunger or winter, can you imagine today if you had no heat in your home and had no food because your refrigerator gave out because you have no electricity, you have no way of contact? That was in the game plan, and these three generals went against it. One general on the Navy ship took his torpedo and blew it out, blew it up 200 miles off the coast, South Carolina. When he come back in for disobeying his order, he was fired. We had two other generals who were in charge of the nuclear weaponry who did the same thing. And they've hidden two of the nukes. Because what was happening? They went down to Texas, the U.S. government, the black ops, and they went and they took all of our weapons and they've sent them to the East Coast. Why South Carolina? Because it's one of the largest ports in the United States of America. And right now, we've got, we're talking with... Iran, we're doing all our bidding with Iran. We haven't talked to them in 35 years and now we're having negotiations. And meanwhile, Saudi Arabia is mad at America and they're teaming up with Russia and they, they're signing a bunch of things with Russia. Where did our missing warheads go? They're being shipped to Saudi Arabia. They're being shipped to our enemies. They're being shipped to those who hate God, hate Israel, and hate Christians. They pluck out your eyes, they cut your arms off. They torture you if you believe in Jesus Christ. That's where we're sending our weapons. Because we've been taken over from the inside. Why? Because just like in Hosea, we have followed what the Israelis did. There are 13 million uh, Jews in the United States of America. They are still walking in the curse. And we have all, and they, their cabal, their satanic Judaism, is leading the pack in all this, the one world government bunch. That's what we're told in the book of Revelation. They call themselves Jews, but they are not. They are actually of the synagogue of who? Satan. They are satanic cabalists, and that's who's leading our world. That's who's leading us. And I thank God for these generals who stood up and said no, knowing they were going to be fired, possibly assassinated, and they didn't do what they were told to do because it was wrong against the Lord. Now, you and I have a couple more days to breathe and you and I, with that freedom and with this heat that we have on, with our electricity that we have on, we need to be sharing the gospel with people and tell them what's going on. Tell them the truth because people don't know the story that I just shared with you today. They're too busy watching TV and Food Network getting ready for Thanksgiving. What I want to do is offer you information that makes you thankful that God is there, that God's large and in charge. See, America deserves what we're about to get. But God's grace has extended it, extended his judgment through prayerfulness of his saints, through us. That's why we are to watch and pray. Who are true Christians? Those who watch and pray. Not people who attend a church and nod their head at the preacher and say, that's a good message, preacher, on the way out the door and don't know what he said. That's not the church, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ are people who study this word, just like Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved to God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, and then you'll be able to rightly divide the word of truth. There's a lot of people presenting the word of God as the word of truth, and they're lying, they're making it up. We call those cults. Anybody who uses or misuses the Bible, uses it wrongfully, is not of God. That's why you and I are to know, rightly divide the word of truth from Genesis to Revelation in every book in between. That's why we challenge you in this Bible study to read it for yourself. Why? Because God said to do that. He said to study to show yourselves approved to Him. Not approved to me. Not approved to the Bible trivia game or the, or the TV show. 
but to prove yourself to the Lord. Lord, I know your heart. I hear your heart. I hear what you're saying. I do what you say. I don't do it perfectly, but I do it with a heart that's perfectly toward you as best I can. And that's what God knows. God sees the heart. Remember what the Bible says about his word? It's a two-edged sword. It pierces way beyond skin, way beyond bone, way beyond your joints, way beyond the marrow of bone, and it gets right down into the discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It gets down to your soul, the nitty-gritty. It gets down to your spirit. It gets down to the real you. And that's why you and I need the Bible in our lives, because it'll cut out everything that doesn't belong. You understand, the body of Christ has a lot of cancer in it. It's not because he brought it in. He heals of cancer. The cancer is sin, and it needs to be eradicated. The only thing that can do that is the Word of God when we accept it and we do what it says to get rid of it. What's that? Confess. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you thankful about that? Aren't you thankful that Jesus forgives, and He forgives completely, and He forgives every time? Aren't you grateful for that? So Jesus is now talking to us, the end-time folks who are no longer just going to Israel, we're going everywhere. And he says, you're going to come to towns, and when you're going to be persecuted, and when you find yourself being persecuted in that town, find you another town to go to. I don't even know what that means today. That's why we need to pray. Lord, what does that mean? We're not being persecuted in Jonesboro, Arkansas. We're good to go right now. But with eyes to see and ears to hear, it's coming to a theater near you. And we need to be ready. We need to be attentive. I pray the Lord comes and gets us. I pray for the rapture. I, I pray, remember, what he, he says he's going to be taking us to a city that's not made with hands. He's going to be taking us to a, another city. I'm hoping he takes us from this city to that one. I hope that's our next move. And the Bible said, you're going to teach the message today? You're going to teach that? I know, it's a Bible. Praise God. Right on. Too bad that wasn't on camera. The camera's a little higher than that. Uh, but anyway, back to our message. Uh, God loves it, and he tells these guys, he says, you're going to go soul winning, and you're going to have to, you're going to have trouble, and when you do, find you another town. Go to people who will listen. What's, what's that another story? What's that telling us? Quit sharing the gospel with people who don't want to hear it. You can't force people to be Christians. Muslims force people to be that. Die or change. And they say, okay, I'll change. And remember the Crusades? That was a satanically backed situation by the church of Christ. And when, when Muslims and other people think about Christianity, what they remember is the Inquisitions and the Catholics who went destroying about everybody who was not a Christian. And it wasn't even Christ's followers. It was people who belonged in a Christian church. People who didn't know the Bible. And they were told, go kill people, force people to be Christians. That is not the Christianity of Scripture. That's why we encourage you to know what the Christianity of Scripture is. The Christianity of Scripture has everything to do with the fruit of the Spirit. It starts with love. I'm not going to kill someone I love. I'm not going to slice their throat. I'm not going to rape their wife and kids in front of them. I'm not going to do that if I love you. It's joy. When I enter the room, I need to be bringing you joy, not misery and fear. Peace. You need to know when you see me, man, you ain't got to walk on eggshells around me. How is he today? I need to bring peace with me, man. I need to be that peacemaker. Not just a peacekeeper, but I need to, where I go, make peace. This is true Christianity. And the list goes on. We know the list here in this Bible study. So that's true Christianity. Jesus says, uh, You shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man become. And uh, what we're talking about here is we're at the end times. When the Son of Man comes is uh, after the rapture. There's going to be a seven-year period. And finally, at the end of that seven-year period, Israel will have had enough. God will have them in hiding. We believe it in an area in Jordan called Petra. And they're going to be protected there. God's going to protect them. Two-thirds of them will have died in this massive war that's coming up. This whole Saudi Arabia, Iran thing. Guys, when you read the Bible, you understand Saudi Arabia hates Iran. They hate Syria. They're two different types of Muslim. You got your Sunni and you got your Shias. The Shia are the Iranians and the Syrians. They're not actually Shia in, in Syria, but they team up with Iran. And then you've got your Mecca folks, and the guys in Iran hate Mecca. And one of the things they want to do with their bomb is blow Mecca up and get rid of that rock that's in the big square thing they walk around, the Kaaba. And see, it's a total demon worship thing. 
They march around this Kaaba, and when they, they finally want to get to the stone and kiss it. And they're kissing the rock from the gods, which is a meteor, and they're worshiping that god. They're not worshiping what they think they're worshiping. They've been lied to. And so their, their, whole, their whole premise is, let's destroy everybody who's not part of us, and that is not Christianity. The Inquisitions, in this, in this Bible study, we are repulsed by the Inquisition. We are repulsed by forcing people to be Christians. Jesus says that they won't be Christians. He didn't say kill them. He said leave town and go tell somebody who will listen. Okay, that's what he said to do. And so we're going to look at verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor is the servant above his Lord. The disciple is not above his master. See, that's what happens in cults. That's what happens in TV ministries. The, the, the TV minister becomes more famous than Jesus himself. His words are more listened to and longed after and sought after. People just can't wait to get to church on Sunday to hear what this guy says, and they won't spend Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday reading the book. Guys, something needs to happen. We preachers need to stand up and say, hey, it ain't about the messenger. It's about the message. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Learn from Him. Have Him teach you. Have Him guide you. Have Him show you what's up next. And we encourage you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to study it for yourself. And he says, The servant is, will never be above his master, nor will a hireling be above his employer, or the servant above his master. Verse 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. Remember, we have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. We represent the master. I'm not above him, but I need to represent him where I go. And that's why it's important for me to be a Bible-listening, thumping Christian. All right? Whatever that means. And, and take the obedience of Christ with us, the love of Jesus everywhere we go. And people will listen. We need to represent him well. It's got, we will never be above Jesus, but he's called us to be alongside of him and represent kingdom of heaven just like he represented it. He's called us to be his ambassadors. That's an awesome calling. That's wonderful that he's called us to do those things. And he says, and the servant will never be above his Lord. We know that's true. You, you, an employee walks into the company, goes to the CEO and says, I hate the way you're doing this, this, blah, blah. What does the CEO do? You're out of here. You're, you're replaceable. You are, you are not inexpendable. You're very expendable. Get. You don't do that. And so God's teaching us a lesson here. We've got to figure out who that is in life, and it's always the Lord. The Lord is everybody's boss. The Lord is your boss's boss, and your boss needs to know that. And if your boss doesn't know that, pray for your boss. Pray for those who have rule over you. Pray for our government. We are told to pray for our government. We're told not to talk bad about them without sharing the gospel. We've got to speak the truth. There were prophets who went right to the king and said, Thus saith the Lord. There was a preacher named Latimer who was preaching the gospel, and one day King Henry was in the audience in England, and while he was preaching, in the middle of his message, Latimer said, Latimer! 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 Be careful what you say. The king is in the audience. And right after that he said, Latimer! 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 Care not what you say, because the king of kings is in the audience. And that's what we need to believe at all times. We need never to be afraid to preach the word of God. We must always remember we are in the presence of God, no matter how majestic somebody might be, or how great they might be. We honor them, we honor the position, we respect them, but it's always in the face of Jesus we stand, in front of his being, in front of his likeness, in front of his love. And that's what he said. He said, uh, it is enough that the disciple be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, remember that the, the uh, Jewish leaders called it Jesus. It's by Beelzebub he's doing these miracles. It's by Beelzebub he's casting out devils. And Jesus said, Beelzebub will not be casting out devils around here. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. We need to stand together with the Lord Jesus. We need to be one with him. And he says, not Beelzebub. Do you guys know who Beelzebub is? He's the Lord of the flies. Why is he the Lord of flies? Because he is the Lord of feces. They called Jesus the Lord of feces, the Lord of dung, is what they were referring to him as. They said, you, you are just a pile. 
You don't belong here. And they were talking to the very God of heaven. And when people in public say, God damn this, God damn that, they're doing the same thing. Because God doesn't damn anything. He delivers the damned. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that He came to save us. For whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. He came not into this world to damn this world. He came into this world because it was already damned. He came to free it from condemnation. That's the story of the gospel. He doesn't damn. He reverses the damnation. Aren't you thankful for that, that He's done that in your life? That's the gospel. That's the good news. God loves you this morning. He is not Beelzebub. He is not Lord of Dung. Lord of the flies. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of every demon who's represented in every religion around the world. He is their Lord, and the demons know it. The demons want to convince humans the opposite of that. That Jesus is old-fashioned, that the Word of God is just outdated. That's what our whole government is pushing right now. That God, God's Word is so outdated and archaic, and we've got to change the laws. Remember what the Bible says about the man of perdition? The man of perdition in the book of Daniel is what we call the Antichrist in the New Testament. And the Bible says one thing about him is he's going to take the laws that have existed and make his own laws up by way of executive order. And if you see firmly what's happening in Washington, D.C., you see this exact same thing taking place. Am I saying Obama is the Antichrist? No, I'm saying he's Antichrist. He has the spirit of Antichrist. He has the spirit of Beelzebub. He does not have the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we're, we've, got, we've done away with Christmas, now we're going to do away with Easter. And we know that Easter is not even a Christian holiday. Okay, We know that. But we know what it represents. Okay, We know that they chose to uh, apply Easter on the day of the Passover, and the day of the resurrection, and the Feast of First Fruits. We know what they've done. And it was the church at large who did this. But you and I in this Bible study, we understand the power of the feasts. We understand the power of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus' body being broken after the Passover, after the blood's been applied. We understand the power of first fruits where Jesus was offered to Jesus and Mary came to hug him at the tomb that morning and he said, hey girl, don't touch me yet. I've not yet ascended to the Father. I've not yet been offered as first fruits in the real temple. Remember when he gave the description of uh, and the diagram to Moses about how the tabernacle would be built. He said, it needs to be this long, it needs to be this, the furniture needs to look like this, the candles need to have seven prongs, this, 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 and the other. And we're told in the book of Hebrews that it was a replica of the temple that is in heaven. That's why it had to be exact. And Jesus, uh, when, when you look at the, the temple or the tabernacle that traveled with Moses for 40 years, and then it was set up in Israel for years and years and years until David's heart said, we need to get a permanent place. The Lord, he has positioned himself and allowed himself to, to be located at a tent. Now, God's everywhere, but it was his uh, ultimate pointing to one location. This is a sanctified place on earth. Don't mess with it, this tabernacle. And everything in that tabernacle pointed to Jesus. And you can see it. When, when you study the tabernacle, and maybe one day we'll do that, when you get down to the tabernacle, you see Psalm 100. We will enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's the gate, the courtyard, getting ready to come to the temple. This morning, did you arrive with thanksgiving in your heart? With a wonderful giving of thanks to the, to the heart of the Lord from your heart to his, the King of Kings? Latimer, 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 the King's in our presence. Latimer, 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 the King of Kings is in his presence. And that's where we stand today. The Lord backs me up. The Lord has my back. The Lord has my front. He has my side. The Bible says he's my buckler and my shield. He's my habergen. He's my sword. He's everything that I need to win this battle. And by the way, he said we've already won the battle. I am now, at this very moment, more than a conqueror. I'm not conquering something. I'm more than a conqueror. How do you become more than a conqueror? Well, you're on the side of the Lord. Because he is more than a conqueror. He's already done the conquering. You and I live in that. We live in the fact that he's already defeated the enemy and he's large and in charge. And so he says right here, he says, uh, if they've called the master of the house Jesus, Beelzebub, he says, how much more shall they call them of his household, you and me? If they called Jesus Lord of Dung, what are they going to call you? And they're going to do it. If they did it to the master, and remember, we are not above our master. He's called us to be on his level. I, it just blows my mind away. Silly, old, stupid, sinful, tripping up me. 
he's elevated me to the position of having seated at his table in the heavenlies, the Bible says. We are part of his executive board. Is that an awesome thing or what? And yet we're still so sinful and st we falter. And he says, if they've called me who's perfect, Beelzebub, how much more are you imperfect people? What are they going to do to you? What If they've killed me, what are they going to do to you? We don't need to expect that it's all pie in the sky and rosy because we've lived in America so long, a lot of Americans think that. A lot of Americans think, oh, God just loves us and, he, and his blessing equals things. His blessing equals, if you love God, He's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. Now, the Bible does say that in Malachi. If we tithe, He will open the windows of heaven and He will pour out His blessings on you. The greatest blessing we know is His presence, His power to change lives. If you've ever encountered somebody who's demon-possessed, and the Lord has led you to speak to that demon, and that person wants that demon out of them. They've got a curse for 50 generations or five generations or their own sinfulness brought, brought this demon in. And they want to be freed. And when you have the opportunity to be part of that freedom service, the Bible says, He that's been forgiven much, the same will love much. And you've never had a hug like you've had from somebody who's been delivered from sinfulness and from their demons. And that's why it's important for you and I to realize how sinful we were, and how much we really have been forgiven. Because if I understand I've been forgiven much, what will my reaction be? I will love the Master much. My love for Him will just grow daily. And the closer you get to Him, the more of your past will pop up. And we got to do what she said to do. And what's that? Not wallow in your past. Dust yourself off, get up, and go and start a new day today. And the Lord promised this. I love this part of the Gospel too. He said he will take all your stupidities, all the, all the mistakes you made, all the cancer, all the cankers, all what the worms have eaten, and he will make all your past a blessing. He will turn your curses into a blessing. Who loves that part, huh? Yeah. And so when the devil starts reminding you about your past and how stupid you were, and you hurt this person, you, you, you know, you're not that great of a guy, gal, blah, blah, blah. you got to say, no, no, he's turned that into a blessing because why because the people i hurt along the way those are the ones i pray for the most now when i think about when satan has me think about them jesus turns that curse into a blessing and now i get to pray for them and the greatest blessing on the planet is to have god in your life to have god at the wheel to have him be your master and your lord and jesus says we're not above our master but if they have called me beelzebub lord of dung lord of the flies if they've called me that they're going to call you a bunch of names. Hang in there. And he said, how much more shall they do it of his household? Don't be afraid of them. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. This world is ran by a secret society, which entails a bunch of different secret societies, fraternities. And the Bible says... They, they plan all their stuff in darkness. They plan their secrets. They plan how can we get the guns away from those crazy Christian Americans to, be, to fall in line with our one world thinking. You and I, the American, are the one who's stopping the one world order. And it's because we are considered a Christian nation. That's why. And as soon as they can take out the Christian nation, they've taken Christ out of all their plans. There's no longer going to be that thing, that cog in the wheel messing up their plans messing up their gearing, okay? Now their gears will work properly. And that's what the Bible tells us. It says, there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to snatch away his bride. Everybody who's in, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God will be taken out. And can you imagine the chaos and the wickedness that'll ensue when that happens? He's called the restrainer. The Holy Spirit in us restrains their plans that they conceive in darkness, that they conceive in secret. We are the ones who are holding them back. And it's important for you to understand that you have a high calling. You are a representative of God. Remember, we're not above the Master, but we are equal as, as He is. And we represent Him. His Spirit's in us. And you and I, our presence in this world as the light in this world, is stopping their darkness from going outside of their secret places. But one day when you and I, the light of the world, are removed, their darkness will cover the entire planet and universe. And that's what's happening. But right now, he says, there's not any secrets that he's not going to shout from the housetops. Aren't you thankful for the internet? Aren't you thankful that when somebody understands what's going on, William Cooper was one of the first guys to ever do this. William Cooper, you can go online and have his assassination. You can hear the phone call when he was assassinated. Because he was revealing the secrets of these people in the dark. 
and he was telling what, what was happening. And he called them the Illuminati. And he named names. And he was saying what their game plan was. And how they turned upside down, right side up. And how they have the power. And all the symbols and all the signs and all the handshakes. He was revealing all their secrets and they had him taken out. There's two black vans they just drove up. They're coming after me. They're coming after me. He's on the phone. Boom, boom, boom. You hear the shots. Take him down. But praise God, that man spawned in other men's hearts that, that we're going to carry this on. Because Jesus said in his scripture, and that's what they're praying. People are praying this. Lord, you said in your scripture that there will be no secrets that remain in the darkness, that you will bring them to light. Help us to know the secrets. Help us to see what the enemy is up to, their game plan, so we know how to pray. And I encourage everybody in this room to pray against the game plan of the enemy. As long as you and I are here, the restrainers here, and we are restraining them, and we have the power to push back. We're not gaining territory. We're not uh claiming dominion for God. Jesus is going to do that when he comes back. He's going to claim the earth. It'll be his, and he doesn't need our help. The Bible says he's going to come back with 10,000 of his saints on horses, but he's going to do the job. We're going to sit back there and watch him do the job and do the cleanup. We're going to watch him destroy, and the blood's going to flow through the valleys 200 miles up to the horse's bridle. We're going to see Jesus do all those things. At, in the meantime, he wants us to love and value people and see sinners as sinners, people who are ensnared by Satan and to bring them the light, to bring them the gospel. Because they are being led. The other side of all this whole thing, guys, all of Hollywood, all of the music industry, I was at a concert last night, psychedelic music, and in Memphis, Tennessee, and all their stuff on the backdrop screen was pyramids and eyeballs and everything. And when you know what's going on, I see what's happening here. And it was, it's all Luciferian, and the people in the audience were just loving it and going with it. And I'm sitting there as... As a guest, I knew it was going to happen. I knew what I, was, what I was getting into. And just prayed before I got there and prayed while I was there. Lord, save these people. Wake, awaken them to what's going on in your world. To the hidden things. But there's these agendas that are coming against people and people don't even know it. Because they're too entertained. Their, their eyes are everywhere else except on the Lord. Remember what he said. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro seeking to bless folks. And there is no place where his eyes or not even in the dark he see he, he was the original guy with night vision there was there's never no night with him he invented night he created it with his word he separated the light from darkness in the very beginning and that's been his game plan ever since and he said these guys don't, don't be afraid of them do not be afraid of these world leaders who hate God and love Satan who commit blood and animal sacrifice on a daily basis as in the old tabernacle the, there was an evening sacrifice and a morning sacrifice every day at the temple. Then on holy days, there was more sacrifices. Satan has counterfeited like he's done everything else. He's stolen what, what was good, and he's turned it into something bad. Marsha and I were talking last week, too. When God created the devil and he created Adam and Eve, there was no evil. The Bible says God does not have a, an evil cell in his body. Evil did not come from him. He says in the scripture... These people have done acts that have never entered my mind. Can you imagine that? Wicked people sacrificing their babies to Baal and Moloch. Jesus says, I, God said, I just, I, I never even thought this. This never entered my mind when I created them. What was Satan's sin? Was it evil? Was it sacrifice? No, it was the most beautiful thing, the most holy thing that God ever created. The problem was God gave that individual a free will and freedom of choice. It was good. How many of you love the fact that you have free will? You can choose to choose Jesus. That's a great gift, isn't it? Satan didn't fall by means of evil. He fell by way of a mirror. Something good. God created him wholesome and good. Adam and Eve, they didn't sin by going out and doing things in secret. All they did was cross the line when God said, hey, that's my tree right there. Don't eat my tree. That one's for me. Y'all enjoy all the rest of the trees. And it was something good that they chose, that they, they said, okay, we're just going to cross God's line. And that's what we do in the daylight. Can you imagine what's happening in the darkness? You, you, your mind cannot go there. Your mind cannot imagine the atrocities that's taking place around the world in the name of Lucifer and Satan and their high holy one. It's terrible, guys, and you and I need to be praying for it. Even though we don't know all the facts, we need to know that there are facts. And we need to be praying, Lord, save these babies, save these mamas, save this, this world. Bring your gospel to these people who have been generationally bound in Satanism and the occult and free them. Give them, a, Let them use their minds and pray this stuff, guys. Guess where I drove day before yesterday? I drove all the way this way 
of the length of the entire airport, and then I hooked a right and drove that entire length of the airport in Denver. And I prayed the whole time. God led me to pray for that place. Why? Because that is the new den of iniquity for the world leadership. That's going to be where the government is ruling from. And they've already got bases and places underground. And God led me to pray. On my way back, I followed the same track. And underneath me, a road, it was for as long as you can see, was black op vehicles. Blacked out windows, black, black vehicles, black tires, black wheels, coming headed south. And I saw him coming, saw him coming for miles, because it's all open out there. I saw him coming, I thought, what in the world is going on here? And then I finally drove over top of them, they're shooting under me, and then they turned off onto a turn, and they just kept going. They kept coming and kept going. I don't know where they were going or what was up, but the Lord leads you to pray for those folks, because they are in the darkness, and they have accepted the darkness and the secrets of that darkness as truth, and God says it's all dark, it's all black, it needs to be brought to light, and it will be brought to light. And how is it brought to light? Through your praying that it will be. Through your diligence. You're knowing this word. And you're being able to identify the enemy. We are in a battle. If you're not going to shoot, at least carry bullets. Help somebody else shoot. Be, help some kind of way. And we're talking spiritual bullets. We're not talking physical. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Stronghold is where a demon has right into your life because of a sin that you've committed. Remember, I was talking about the gatekeeper. We got to close those doors. We got to get the demons out of our lives. Demon can't possess. If you're a Christian, a demon can't possess your spirit, but they can sure possess your body and soul. I've seen it. I've seen people on deliverance teams who their calling is to help people be free from demons, and they themselves are demonized. And that demon will show up, man. And, and it's always different. It depends who the demon is. And that person needs to be delivered because they, they, they sometimes they don't even know that they've been under a generational curse, a family curse. What happened? And you've got to communicate with the devil. Uh, there was murder. Who was murdered? His grandmother was murdered. Or how many generations back? Fifty generations or five generations. And they tell you. The devils have to tell you the truth. It's men who lie. And the devils want you to uh, think that you are not superior to them. Guys, we are on the level of Jesus. Remember what we just read? If Jesus could do these things, you and I can do these things by faith. And God wants us. And people around you, they may not just you know, be a jerk. They might be demonized. And that demon shows up when you do. And they come against you. Or they just might be a jerk. Either way, they need prayer. And you and I need sensibilities. We need sensitivity to figure out what's going on here, Lord. I know it's bad. I know this is part of those who dwell in secret. The enemy, Satan, and see what's happening. If, if you got your eyes open, Satan and his kingdom are coming closer and closer and closer to above ground. They're doing things now that they never would have done 20 years ago. They're being blatant with their Satanism. They're being blatant. We got Lady Gaga praising Lucifer on late night shows. I praise Lucifer. She is an agent of Satan, guys. You got to know it. And so's all of those top 40 folks. Miley Cyrus, that's not just some girl being skanky. That is a demonic episode. She's preaching the gospel to a people who understand what she's saying through her signs and symbols. The whole tongue out thing? Study the Indian god Shiva. One of the three most deadly gods in India. The three leading gods in all Hindu. The god of death. That's who she's being. And she's telling us the god of death is about to be released on you, America. On you, world. And that's what she's telling us. And you and I need to listen to that. And the big old one finger she's got is telling a story. It's more than just some act that's being performed on TV. They are preaching a message. It is time for you and I to tune in and realize that God wants to bring to light everything they do in darkness. We need to understand what they're saying and what they're preaching and pray for them. Not come against them and judge them, but pray for them. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and there's nothing hid that will not be known. What I tell you in darkness... Jesus says, in Christianity, I don't want there to be any secrets. So any Christian who belongs to a secret society and they have a bunch of secrets, they are wrong against God. He says, what I tell you guys one-on-one, -on -one, what I tell you privately in your private devotions, I don't want you to keep it to yourself. I want you to share it with everybody. See, God hates secrets because there are no secrets with God. God knows everything. 
And so he wants us to be transparent. He wants us to be open. Now, there's a big difference in sharing your family business and all that stuff. We're not talking about those things where common sense and wisdom kick in. But what we're talking about is letting your light shine. Being a faithful witness. That's what we're talking about. And when God shares something with you, it's not just for me and, and, and those of us. And we don't need to hate it as, as our group grows. A lot of people hate that. Oh, we were such a good family until you know, we had five more people join and then ten more people. And now we're not such a tight family anymore. That's your fault. Whoa! Being a tight family is up to you. Hanging out and being friends, that's up to you. That's your job. You do that. We don't place the blame on other people or other things. And if we stay small, it's great too. I love that. I love our family that we have. But don't hate the work of God taking place. Okay? And he says, I'm going to tell you stuff in your private place, in your secret place. See, that's where God speaks to you as an individual. When you're concentrating on him, your heart's on him, he'll give you dreams, he'll give you visions, he'll share something from the word of just open up your spirit to some things you didn't even recognize before then. And when he shares those things with you, we are to share it and we need to speak it in light. And what you hear in your ears, preach it from the housetops. Don't hold the truth in. When you get a chance to share truth that will bless folks, let her out. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill your body, but are not able to kill the soul. I want you to fear him that's able to take your body and your soul and throw it straight into hell. In other words, he says, don't fear the bad guys. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I shall not fear. We've got to preach that to ourselves. Fear not, fear not, fear not. We've got to coach ourselves to that till it becomes a natural impulse. See, our natural impulse is to run in fear, to hide from scary things, from bad things. That's our natural impulse. God's called us to a supernatural one, to obedience. And we need to obey Him, obey God rather than men. And do not fear people who can put a bullet in your head or cut your head off. You need to fear Him who can throw you into hell. And see, that's what these people aren't doing. They don't fear God, they put a fist in His face. And you and I don't need to fear man because I'm not going to die until it's my day to die, until it's my moment to die. Fear not. Jesus says that. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Let not your hearts be troubled. And if your heart's troubled this morning, and, and if death haunts you, you are listening to a demon spirit. Because Jesus comes to give you life. And he wants you to have abundant life. And do not fear death or its messengers. Do not fear the death bringers. That means don't be afraid of them. But he says we need to honor and reverence and respect the one who brings life. And see, at Judgment Day, there's going to be people who are going to hell. And it's because they're, they're going to face one who they didn't reverence in life. And they didn't do what he said, and they didn't accept his only begotten son. They didn't accept him. It's going to be Jesus who's the judge. And they, they're going to know right then what they did. They're going to know immediately after they die what they did. And so are people who believe. As soon as we die, it will be worth it all. When we see Jesus... Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Do not fear man. He can take out your body. He can put you in the ground. Then you have heaven. We need to reverence Him who can, after my death date, because we're all going to die, has the power to throw it into hell. You and I who believed in him, we don't have to worry about that. I am free in Jesus Christ. If I have Jesus, I have life. I will never face Jesus the judge. I only face Jesus my friend. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thought? And he said, hey, don't be afraid of those who can take you out with a bullet or a knife or a rope or kill you or, or bring threats against you. Don't fear threats. You're not going to go until God says it's time to go. But are not, they're not able to take your soul. So that's why we can have joy in the face of death. We can have peace in the face of death. And I've talked to many folks who were facing death and God gave them an, an absolute calmness of peace in that moment where they were ready to die. They didn't die, but they were ready. God gave them grace and he gave them mercy and he'll do that for every one of us. We do not need to fear death. He says, but rather we need to respect him who's able to take and destroy both soul and body in the grave and in hell. Let's look at all those verses again today. 
But when they persecute you in this city, pray about it. Go to another one where they won't persecute you. But really, I, say, I hope that's heaven. I hope that's the next city we have to go to. We have to flee to. That would be a good prayer, wouldn't it? Even so come, Lord Jesus. He told us to pray that. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready for you. Uh, my prayer for us is that we will learn to hate this world. Because the Bible tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, yeah, more, more, more. The lust of the eyes, ooh, 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 I want that and that and that and that and that. And the pride of life, look what I did. God says he hates those things. And whoever lives in those things are going to be wiped out. But those of us who live in Jesus live in life. Hate the world. The Bible calls those people who love the world earth dwellers. I, I can't do without this. I can't do without that. Oh, guys, if we would get our hearts and minds on, on the fishing pond in heaven, on the sea dew in heaven, of the things in heaven which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither entered into the imaginations of those who fear him, if we would concentrate on heaven and read that word and concentrate on the king of all kings, we would live heavenly minded and the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The problem with people is we don't have his glory and grace in our lives. God wants us to have that. And he says, but they're going to persecute you in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel until the Son of Man become. In other words, at that second mountain, there's going to be those 144,000. There's going to be the two witnesses who are sharing the gospel of Jesus again. And there's going to be people saved, saved, saved. And there's going to be people getting their heads cut off because they won't get the mark. And then God's going to provide safety for the Israelites, uh, one third of who's living now. The disciple is never to be above his master, nor is the servant above his employer. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. Ain't that great? God made us on his, that's how he sees us, as his equal, as his brother. He called us joint heirs with Christ, not co-heir. A co-heir is 50-50. A joint heir is whatever's his is money. I have access to all of it, 100 100 Ain't that great? And he says, it's enough that the disciple be as his maker and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house the Lord of dung, how much more, are, what kind of names are they going to call you? Do not fear those people. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and there is nothing hid that shall not be made known. What I tell you in darkness, speak in light. And what you hear in the ear, preach it from the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who can kill your body, but are not able to take your soul. Rather, you need to respect him, which is able to take your body and soul, destroy them, and cast them to hell. That sounds like a good deal, don't it? Why don't we reverence the Lord and not fear man? That's what he's calling us to do. Don't be afraid of people. Love people. Understand that God's large and in charge in their lives too. And they can't touch you until the time for you to be touched. And we walk with him in joy and in the fruit of the Spirit and share that with other people. And what's in secret, it'll be revealed. We, we're, we just come across the 50th anniversary of JFK. Nobody knows what really happened. They will. It's going to be revealed. Every bit of it. If it's not in this life, it will be at judgment. God's going to show every guilty person what they did. And there was the guy in the grassy knoll, and there was the guy in the book repository, and there was this guy. But Lord, I, I, I didn't know. You're guilty. You're a liar, and you're a cover-up. You did things in secret, and I'm going to reveal them openly right now. You and I don't ever have to face that. God will never point out our faults, our sins. He's only there to give us rewards for the things we've done for him in the body at our judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what we're looking forward to. Think about the pond, the ocean in heaven. Think about the forest in heaven. You don't even know how to think right about heaven. But try it. It might change your opinion of earth. And who's running it? Who's the God of this world? Who's the God of this world? Remember that. Hey guys, we thank you for being a part of our lesson today. I hope it was a blessing to you. However God spoke to you, just let him do it. Let him do his job, and you do your job by listening and just doing what he says to do. That's the place of safety. That's where you'll find grace. That's where you find mercy. That's where you find shelter and safety in these rough times today. Just let God be God. You be his subject and follow after him with a full fervor. He loves you, and we'll see you next time.